Luke 24. Father, I thank you for this time. I ask that you bless your word as we get into it. Um, I ask that you would, um, your spirit would have his way, that he would fill me afresh, and that it would be your wisdom and strength and knowledge and um, your heart that's conveyed here tonight. Lord, I just ask that you would uh, move powerfully through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we're going to look at... Um, basically three things concerning the resurrection here in the last chapter of Luke. Um, it deals largely with the resurrection in the time period um, where Jesus rises from the dead um, and then ends with the ascension. Um, and so firstly, um, these are kind of loose. I'm not intending this to be an actual outline of this passage because this is one of those parts of the Gospels where you really have to correlate it to the other Gospels to get the whole picture because Luke gives you his part of the narrative, but there's a lot of information that you have to go to the other Gospels to get and to, to see get the whole picture. We're not really going to do that tonight, but we are going to um, look at three things. We're going to look at the some proofs of the resurrection. Um, we're going to see those in verses uh, 1 through 12, and then in some other verses <clears throat> as well. Uh, and we And then in verses 13 through 31, we're going to look at relating to the risen Christ. I think it uh, verses 13 through 31, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus has a lot of implications for relating to the risen Christ. And then finally, in verses 32 through 43 and some other verses uh, in the New Testament, we're going to look at why the resurrection matters. So firstly, looking at proofs of the resurrection. Now, on the first day of the week, that is Sunday, it's why we uh, Jews worship on Saturday, which is the last day of the week. Um, the Sabbath is on Saturday. Uh, Christians, because Jesus rose on Sunday, on the first day of the week, that's why um, the, the church began meeting on the first day of the week. Obviously, there was, I don't know if God spoke to one of the leaders of the church at that time period and said, hey, meet on Sunday instead of Saturday. It was logical. It was um, an, an interesting change. It also made sense because they were meeting in the temple. Um, and I don't know if it would have been wise to meet in the temple on the sab on the actual Sabbath. But that being said, <clears throat> now on the first day, that is Sunday of the in the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they this is the women mentioned in the previous verses, verse fifty five, and the women who had come with him from Galilee. So they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. These are angels. Um, the other gospels, we get a little more information about them. But I want to look here firstly as one of the first proofs of the resurrection is that there is a lack, a lack of three things in the, the gospel narratives. There is a lack of three things in the gospel narratives that are some of the strongest proofs <coughs> of the resurrection. And, and what I mean by that is the proofs that the, re, the witnesses and that their accounts are reliable. Um, so firstly, there is a lack of contrived circumstances. There is a lack of contrived circumstances. Secondly, we're going to see that there's a lack of corroboration. There is a lack of corroboration between the gospel writers and the, and the, the, the witness accounts. And thirdly, there is a lack of credible witnesses. We're going to see there's a lack of credible witnesses. But so firstly, there's a lack of contrived circumstances. I don't know if you've ever felt underwhelmed reading, and, and I, I hope that's not a bad word to use in this situation, but I believe it's intentional. Um, I don't know if you've ever felt underwhelmed reading of, of the, this part of the gospel narrative of Jesus manifesting himself to his disciples, but to be honest, it's actually kind of anti it's kind of uh it's it seems counterintuitive to the way that people who are very haughty and prideful would seek to reveal themselves after their after an event like dying and now they're resurrecting he he's reveals himself like um individually to people and kind of in his in the 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 revelations of himself to people are kind of sticky and not smooth like 
when Mary comes to the tomb and she's by herself and she sees him and doesn't realize it's him and thinks he's the gardener, that's a really odd first revelation of himself, if I'm honest with you. I kind of always am like, this is odd. Like, But here's the deal. The reason I, I point this out is because to contrive means to plan and to systematically put something in order to to create something. And the idea that the gospel writers, if they had been trying to contrive the resurrection that Jesus had risen from the dead, even though he hadn't, um, usually when people contrive something, they tend to try to give it substance by adding to it or by making it more grandiose. Um, and they try to avoid things that seem uh, kind of um, sticky or, or unimpressive. That's something that, you know, there was widespread skepticism and confusion among his disciples. You know, the, the ladies, apparently there was confusion. You know, the, people like to point that out and they're like, oh, look, all of the gospel accounts differ on what women and when and who went to the tomb and all this stuff. And I'm going to read something in a moment that kind of reconciles a lot of that. But the truth is, is that, dude, there was a lot of confusion that morning. It's not that any of the accounts aren't true. It's that it's very, very, very likely, in my opinion, that some or one or several of the women went to the tomb multiple times and were confused. And there's probably a going back and forth. But that being said, there is a serious lack of contrived circumstances about the resurrection and Jesus revealing himself to people. People continually are not recognizing him, which seems, as we're going to see later in this passage, intentional. Um, <clears throat> but if I'm honest with you, it's a little underwhelming. You almost would expect for him to manifest himself to them on a mountaintop. You know, he's going to walk through the gates of life on a mountaintop or something. That's not what happens. He reveals himself in a roundabout way to a lady in the garden first. And then he reveals himself in a roundabout way to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then he reveals himself, the disciples, not all the disciples are in a room talking and he reveals himself to them there and Thomas isn't there. And, and I have to be honest with you, when you start looking at all that, it sounds really true to how life actually unfolds. There's something completely uncontrived about the whole thing and, and, and actually gives the account some serious legitimacy um, to the, at least to the, the witnesses' accounts. Secondly, there's a, a serious lack of corroboration. Now, Simon Greenleaf was probably the most famous person who, who first brought this up that I've ever heard of. You know, Josh McDowell brought this up um, much later, but Simon Greenleaf was the foremost law professor of his time, period. He was um, the, the, the foremost law professor at Harvard Law School. This is like 100, 150 years ago. And he basically was trying to do the exact same thing Josh McDowell was trying to do. He went about trying to expose the Gospels as frauds. And he actually, the more he studied them, he became convinced that they were actually true accounts. And in um, his book, The Testimony of the Evangelist, you want to talk about a wordy short book, I highly recommend you read The Testimony of the Evangelist by Simon Greenleaf. Um, he wrote, and he basically, and, and I don't know if you guys remember who was here, but when we started the book of Luke, I actually read the full quote from Simon Greenleaf in The Testimony of the Evangelist. Um, I'm not going to do that again tonight. Uh, I just encourage you to read it. But he basically talked about the fact that one of the surest signs when you are interviewing multiple witnesses in a court case that they are lying is when their stories match perfectly or nearly perfectly. He's like, if you have five different people witness an event, particularly if there's stress involved or there's the event is sudden or unexpected or shocking, whatever, you know, as a crime often is, if there's one thing you can be sure of if you're getting true testimonies is that none of the testimonies will be exactly the same. And actually, the variation in the testimonies will be significant. And um, I'm going to read some from Josh McDowell, and he's going to actually explain how to separate um, real variation from false variation, but um, there is a serious lack of corroboration in the gospel narratives. If they were lying, the, the gospels would sound, would be very parrot-like. They would sound exactly like each other, but there are, there are significant individualities in the gospels, though not contradictions. And so let me read what Josh McDowell says on this. Don't the resur This is under the topic, don't the resurrection accounts contradict each other? 
The Apostle Paul stated, If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, we are, and we are found false witness of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. A common objection to the fact of the resurrection is that the four gospel narratives contain hopeless contradictions. If the four accounts were placed in parallel columns, a number of apparent differences would be highlighted. However, these apparent differences ultimately confirm the truthfulness of these accounts rather than refute them. If all four gospels gave exactly the same story in exactly the same order and exactly the same details, we would immediately become suspicious. We could also wonder why all four writers did not simply attach their names as co-authors of one account. Obviously, this is not the case. None of the four Gospels gives all of the details that transpired. And actually, I don't know if you've ever heard it. Michael might be able to explain this better. But um, Chuck Missler actually explained that in, in Spycraft, uh, he, used to, he worked for the CIA, right, at one point? I think he did. I think he... But in, in Spycraft, they actually, when they're trying to transfer code uh, or trying to transfer vital information... Um, in such a way that you you don't actually, uh, how do you explain this? What did he? Do you remember what he called it when he talked about how the truths are written in such a way in Scripture that they're not okay? This book deals with this aspect of the Christian life. This book deals with this. He he wrote it so that if you're missing any part of it, you can still get all of the main truths from a bunch of different pieces of the book, and it's actually intentional. But be that as it may. Um, there's, it's actually intentional. I don't know if you've ever wondered, like, why is the Bible written the way it is in the sense that if I want to study prayer, I have to go to this verse in this book, I have to go to this paragraph in this book, I have to go to this section in this book, and that's actually intentional because not every time period in human history has the entire Bible been available to everybody, right? I mean, that's, that's a relatively recent thing, and not only is it relatively recent, it's relatively... Um, regionalized in the sense that it's only in certain countries where everybody has access to the entire scriptures. And Missler's point was, you can have somebody in China that only has as only has as access to like maybe Matthew and maybe a part of Joshua or something like that, but they can still get most of the main themes from a relatively small amount of scripture because of the way it's laid out. Because if it had been way, if it had been laid out like a, like a textbook, if you only had one chapter, you'd only know about prayer. But because it's laid out the way it is, you can have one book. You can have the book, the Gospel of Matthew, and you can get most, if not all, of the main themes in that book. And it's actually there's a real brilliance to that argument that he was talking about. That in in that kind of um, I don't know if it was called spycraft or how he referred to it, but you guys get the idea that it's actually intentional that the Bible is laid out the way that it is, that God did it this way. So back to what um, Josh McDowell is saying here. If all four Gospels gave exactly the same story and exactly, okay, uh, obviously this is not the case. None of the four Gospels gives all of the details of what transpired. Matthew is the only writer who records the first appearance to the women, while only in Luke do we find the account of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The appearance to Mary, Magdalene, is omitted by Luke. Only John records the appearance of our Lord in the upper room. When Thomas was absent and the appearance... And, uh, only John records the appearance of our Lord in the upper room when Thomas was absent and the appearance on the Sea of Galilee. It is quite clear that all of the Gospels relate their portraits of Jesus differently. This is what we should expect. No four witnesses or news reporters all of whom witness a series of events will write them up in exactly the same way, detail for detail. If they did, there would be obvious collusion. If the differences concerned the main points of the story, then there would be justification for doubt. But when the salient points are agreed upon by every witness, insignificant differences add to rather than subtract from the validity. It should be noted, too, that none of the details necessarily flatly contradicts any others, but in some plausible way they correlate together to supply the larger picture. The variations in detail the different writers choose to include in the resurrection narratives consist of incidental things which in no way jeopardize the main plot of the story. One of the seeming contradictions that bothers people concerns the time women came to the tomb, related differently by John and Mark. 
Mark's account has the women coming to the tomb at the rising of the sun, while John states that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb when it was dark. This difficulty is solved when it is realized that the women had to walk quite some distance to reach the grave since they stayed in Jerusalem or Bethany. It was dark when they left the place in which they were staying, but when they arrived at the tomb, the sun was beginning to shine. Therefore, Mark is speaking of their arrival while John refers to their departure. The area which has generated the most discussion concerns the angels who were at the tomb of Jesus. Matthew and Mark relate that one angel addressed the women, while Luke and John say that two angels were at the tomb. This seems to say that two angels were at the tomb. This seems to be a discrepancy with Matthew and Mark knowing of only one angel while Luke and John speak of two, uh, two. However, Matthew and Mark do not say that there was only one angel at the tomb, but that one angel spoke to the women. This does not contradict Luke and John, for Matthew and Mark specify that one angel spoke, but they do not say that there was only one angel present or only one angel spoke. Quite possibly, one of the angels served as a spokesman for the two, thus he was emphasized. There is no need to assume a discrepancy, though they report some of the details differently. The Gospels agree in all important points. The accounts are in harmony on the fact that Jesus was dead and buried, that the disciples were not prepared for his death, but were totally confused, that the tomb was empty on Easter morning, that the empty tomb did not convince them that Jesus had risen, that Mary, that Mary thought the body had been stolen. The Gospel writers also concur that the disciples had certain experiences which they believed to be appearances of the resurrected Christ, that the normative first century Judaism had no concept of a dying and rising Messiah is a historical fact. The disciples proclaim the resurrection story in Jerusalem in the place where Jesus had been killed and buried. All of these facts considered together constitute a powerful argument for the validity of the resurrection story. The venerable scholar Wilbur Smith had this to say about the differences in the resurrection accounts and the areas in which the Gospels agree. In these fundamental truths, there are absolutely no contradictions. The so-called variations in the narratives are only the details which were most vividly impressed upon one mind or another of the witnesses of the Lord's resurrection or on the mind of the writers of the, these four respective Gospels. The, closet, the closest, most critical examination of these narratives throughout the ages never had destroyed and can never destroy their powerful testimony to the truth that Christ did rise from the dead on the third day and was seen of many. So the serious lack of corroboration between the gospel writers, as mentioned there, it does not detract from the, the validity of the witnesses' accounts. It actually adds to it. it. And the people that study such things, criminology and that, and, and how to tell if witnesses are telling the truth, all say the same thing. The third proof of the resurrection that is a la the third lack of credible witnesses as a proof. There is a lack of credible witnesses as a proof of the resurrection, i.e., women. <laughs> this isn't me speaking. Hold on. Let me read this to you. This is really interesting. I'm sure you guys are aware of this, so I'm not going to beat this point to death, but it was. If they wanted to be taken seriously in first century Palestine, um, the last people that you would have Jesus, if they were making it all up, reveal himself to first, um, for credibility's sake, would be women. The reason being, and, and let me just read you something someone from that time period wrote, um, that women were not held in high esteem. We know that. In Greco-Roman culture, a woman's testimony was not admissible in court. In Jewish circles, it took the testimony of two women to equate to that of one man. If one were to invent a story, the last people one would place as the first witnesses would have been women unless it were otherwise true. So there was a lack of credible witnesses, which again, if you think about it, lends itself to the truth that in that day and age, and this was according to Brian Chilton, that that day and age, they just, you know, the Pharisees, when they woke up in the morning, they prayed that, God, I thank you that I'm not a what a dog, a Samaritan, or a woman, or a Samaritan, a, a woman, or a dog, or something like that. Like, women were not highly esteemed in that time period. And if the narrative was being made up, the last thing they would have done in that culture was say that he revealed himself to women first. Now, as a sidebar, completely let's leave this topic of the resurrection for a moment, because I can't come across a truth like this without, again, reiterating something that I think is extremely important. Christianity is the greatest 
and has been for two millennia the greatest force in human history in the equalization of women. Period. Period. I know in our day and age, we live in a day and age where there are people of a certain political persuasion that like to tell us that the gospel writers and Paul the apostle were chauvinists and that they wanted to keep women down. And and here's the problem. Let me let me I'm going to not get political here, but I want to say something really important. For the last 3 years after the last president was elected, various people at various times have dogged the president for various reasons. And one of the things I love is when they are quoting somebody on the news about how bad things are in the United States as far as the economy and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, look, I'm sorry. You can say whatever you want and you can quote whoever you want. I don't even care if you like the guy in the office. I'm not even talking about whether I like the guy in the office. But I'm going to tell you that I work in an industry and I work in a job where the day before he got elected, we were struggling for work and my my company and my industry had been struggling for work for eight years. And the day after he got elected, the day after he got elected, the floodgates opened and everybody started building houses like crazy. So don't tell me that – here's what I'm getting at. I, that's all to say this. I'm not trying to get on a soapbox about that. That is all to say this. When you hear a professor or a talking head on a TV screen tell you a fact or tell you something they found from a survey or tell you something from some manipulated numbers they have – and your plane, what you see with your own two eyes in your own experience out in the world contradicts it, you need to throw that out in the window. Because this is the problem. There are a lot of talking heads, there are a lot of professors that will tell us that Christianity is chauvinist, that Christianity represses women, that Christianity holds women down, and it is a bold-faced, flat-out lie that is plainly and obviously unfactual, and it's that is basically provable simply with just a globe. If we put a, a simple children's globe here on this, these pallets and we blindfold David and we spin the globe and we tell him to point to it and his finger points to it, I am telling you the truth, 99 and a half, 99.9% .9 of the time, the country that his finger points to, the level of equality of women and elevation of women in that culture will be in direct proportion to the impact of Christianity on that culture. That is plainly true. If his finger falls on China, let me ask you a question. Are women elevated and equal in China? If you know anything about what's going on in the world, they are not. Little girls have been, I don't know if they're still doing this to this degree now, but little girls were being thrown in, little baby girls were being thrown in dumpsters for the last five decades because girls weren't valued like sons where they couldn't work in the field and so they just post aborted them in dumpsters and and to this day you you, you spin the globe it well let me ask you a question has christianity had ever had a large impact in china no it's never had been more than one or two percent of the population you spin the globe again and his finger falls on somewhere like somewhere really bad like venezuela, venezuela or um, I'm thinking more of somewhere where it's widely understood that there's like farmers sell their little girls into trafficking trades like India. India or well, yeah, I guess I don't know. I've never heard of it in Venezuela, but you know, like Thailand where it like people sell their sons and daughters into slavery of various forms. Has Christianity ever had a, a, a large scale impact in Thailand or, or in India? And the, in the plain answer that you and I know is obviously true is no. You spin the globe again and it lands on Saudi Arabia. Are women equal or elevated in Saudi Arabia? No. Has there ever been a large Christian presence in Saudi Arabia? No. It's Muslim. Thailand is what? Buddhist or, or there's, you know, when you get down near Indonesia, you get a lot of Islam too, but China is Buddhist or, or atheist. Let's be really clear about that. Buddhism doesn't believe in a God. It's an atheistic uh, worldview, which is why it can coincide with communism, sort of. But if you you end up on Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, we could just start listing places. Say, are women equal in these places? No. To the degree that women are equal will be to the degree in 99.9% .9 of the time in exact proportion to the influence Christianity has had in that nation. Spin the globe again and you land on America. 
are women equal in America? I would say no. I'd say they're actually above, e they're past equal. I don't know if you guys ever actually, they don't actually show you the women picketing out in front of the Supreme Court, the feminists. You know why? Because they're not asking for equality. They're saying we're better than you. Yeah, because on the occasion they accidentally actually show the women in the background, the feminists, with their big, they don't say we want equality. They say we're better than you and we want to drug you into becoming women. That's what their signs say. It's no, they are, it's not equal actually. They're elevated above men. Has Christianity had a big impact in America? Yeah, you could say that. You could say it's had a big impact in America. Spin it again, and your finger lands where? England. Are women equal in England? Yes. Has Christianity has, had a big impact in England? Yes. 99% of the time that you do this, plainly, you will find it is plainly true that women are equal to men in direct proportion to the influence that Christianity has had in that culture. And I, I, I'm frankly tired. I'm going to have an age in my life and a time in my life where I'm tired of people who, you know, it's, they've got a PhD, it's piled high and deep, and they want to tell me that I'm a chauvinist and that the, the Bible I read is chauvinistic and Christianity is chauvinistic when the facts are plainly obvious when I look out at the world that that is not true. It's only because Christianity elevates women that women have been able to come to a place in our culture where some of them have even run a little wild and, and are saying, we're better than you and we're going to drug you into becoming women because women are more highly evolved. And can I tell you that's only possible because Christianity, Christianity is tolerant. Crazy to think of this, but Christianity is the most tolerant. We don't preach that a whole lot and we don't talk about that a whole lot. Um, because the, the, the other side has taken it and they are not tolerant. They're tolerant with you as long as you agree with them, which is not tolerance. But Christianity is tolerant. We don't kill our enemies. We believe that our enemies should have a free will because God wants them to have a free will. God doesn't want them to be coerced into believing what we believe. There are other religions out there today that believe in coercion. It's the fundamental element of their religion, of most of the other ones. And so... I just, I have to make that point because it, it's just so plain. It's one of those things, like you can watch the news and they'll tell you the sky is red and I'm like, the sky is not red, it's blue. Quit telling me that Christianity is chauvinist because you don't know what you're talking about. That is complete garbage. The only reason we're having this conversation in this country is because of Christianity. Try going to China and saying that Buddhism is chauvinistic and see what happens. You're going to go to jail. Try and tell them that communism is chauvinistic. You're going to go to jail. Do that in Thailand. Do that in Venezuela. The only reason you're, you, you are tolerated doing it here is because Christianity has created an environment of tolerance that has been warped out of control by other elements of the society. But I'm telling you what, Christians, Christians elevate women. Christian men love women. And, they, and you, I'm, you guys know this, that, that I just... That really gets my goat, though. And this, this elevation of women that you see in, in so many different nuances throughout Scripture, it, you see it so clearly here that Jesus, the first person he chose to reveal himself to, was a woman. It's incredible. I love that about it. I, secondly, and there are a lot of proofs. I was reading a lot online. Some people have like ten proofs of the resurrection. I'm only doing four or five. The second thing, and this was an interesting one that I came across online that I really liked. The second thing that is a proof of the, the accuracy and the veracity of the, of the um, biblical, of these witnesses and their, their stories is the embarrassing details. And there are a lot of embarrassing details in the gospel if you really think about it. You know, the, like the fact that some of them were really slow to believe. And, and literally, the, you know, you have... Um, the story here as we read on so verse 24 picking up in 5 chapter 24 picking up in verse 5 then as they were afraid embarrassing detail and they bowed their faces to the earth they said to them why do you seek the living among the dead he is not here but is risen remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee remember again another embarrassing detail the people that were relying on their account these women here were embarrassing them by pointing out the their failures here and they remembered his words then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest it was mary magdalene joanna mary the mother of james and the other women with them and the other 
and who told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, probably because they were women, and they were steeped in that first century Greco-Roman Juda Judaism, Palestine. They were steeped in that belief that, oh, they're women, they're just silly. They don't even know what they're talking about. Again, embarrassing details. Um, <clears throat> I like what Brian Chilton has to say about this. Historically speaking, embarrassing details add veracity to a historical claim. The fact that women were the first witnesses that a member of the Sanhedrin, the same Sanhedrin that executed Jesus, had to give Jesus a, pro a proper burial, and that the disciples were fearful and fled all serve as embarrassing factors for the resurrection accounts. Um, thirdly, the witness, there are witnesses. Now, this is not talking about lack. This is talking about one of the great proofs of the resurrection is the witnesses. Um, as picked up in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to turn there, please do so. Verses 1 through 8 say this, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Here's the thing. Interesting in verse 6, because he's, he's highlighting to his writers that he was seen by over 500 people at a time, and then he makes a statement that's important. He says, of the greater part, of whom the greater part remain to the state. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? He's saying that because you can go and talk to him. You can actually go interview them. And at that point, you might say, well, that's great, Chris. I can't, though. What about me? And this is where I, I hope you're paying attention because this is really important. I was asking the Lord that question at one point, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I get this. I had a very specific audience. You know, it was written to these people in Corinth in the first century, and that they could, should they want to, go out and find some of these 500 people and interview them and get their accounts and be like, well, that's pretty heavy. But here's the truth. I, I'm telling you right now, any single one of you could make that your purpose in life. And I, I promise you that if you wanted to, you could go out in the world today and find 500 believers who are witnesses of the resurrected Christ. Not that actually saw him in the flesh in Galilee in the first century, but have seen him do such incredible things in their life that you would have a hard time not believing that he rose from the dead. You see... He is resurrected. He is here now. He is alive today, and he is extremely active today, and he still moves powerfully and miraculously with that resurrection power in people's lives. I think of Brother Yoon, who was thrown into who, who was thrown into a Chinese prison for being a pastor and a Christian, and they crushed his legs with four by fours in a in a in a Chinese high security prison, and he's there in this room half starved to death with his legs crushed and God heals his legs miraculously and opens the doors of the prison and the guy walks out and you can meet him. You can go meet this guy and you can hear of his account of the resurrected Christ and what he's doing today. You could go volunteer at Gospel for Asia to go on the mission field in India and you could meet hundreds and hundreds of people who have been miraculously and powerfully healed of incredible things of incredible things things that biblical things arms that were limp and, and withered being restored to fully I, I have a friend went to acquire the fire with him dude he went he went on one of their mission trips and they would pray for people and he dude he's like I we prayed for somebody in the jungle and they were blind and their eyes were like malformed and he's like I watched this guy's eyes be reformed right in front of me and he could, his sight was restored to him from, because a bunch of teenagers were laying hands on him and praying for him. Here's my point. If you're following me, this is a really important truth here. And it is that the risen Christ is still actively involved in our world today. He still loves people. And if you so wanted to, you could go out and find easily 500 people who would, could testify of the things that he's still doing today in the world, in people's lives and it would blow your socks off. I don't have time to go on and like tell you like John Corson's story or, or some of the things that he's done in my life that are 
honestly less impressive maybe, but to me are, are as important because they happen to me. But the risen Christ is still active. And you could easily, if you wanted to, go out and find 500 people who could give witness, strong witness, to the fact that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And he is still alive and active today. Fourthly, and this isn't something we see so much in Luke, it's more of one of the more important arguments, though, about the veracity of the witness accounts of the resurrection. Persistence in perpetuating what they saw. It is true that people will die for a lie. But it is not true, generally speaking, 99.9999% of the time, that people will die for something they know is a lie. I remember re watching a, um, a television, uh, it was like an expose on this very small group of people somewhere near India that were really radical and they believed something kind of that the rest of the society thought was weird and so the society was like persecuting them and so these people like carried cyanide pills on them and were willing to die for what they believed and this, that and the other and, and I remember being kind of like, oh, that's kind of crazy, they're willing to die for what they believe. And I was struggling with them, like, oh, well, Christians are willing to die for what they believe too. So how does that, how do we reconcile that? And the truth is, is that they genuinely believe what they believe is the truth. And people are willing to die for a lie if they don't think it's a lie. But here's the problem, and this is one of the greatest arguments, in my opinion, it's probably the greatest argument for the gospel accounts, is that all 11 of the apostles, John obviously wasn't killed uh, in the first attempt, but all 11 of the, of the apostles who witnessed to Jesus being risen from the dead were all violently and brutally murdered, martyred, murdered at the end of their lives for this thing. All they had to do was say, hey, we hid the body in the fifth bush to the left. And I'm sorry if you if the, anybody who considers this part of it honestly cannot argue against this truth. We know that it is plainly and simply human nature. Um, if, if all we have is us, self-preservation is all we have. It's, if you think about it, it's highlighted in Interstellar. I don't know who's seen Interstellar, but if you've seen it, if you remember when they get to Matt Damon's planet, dude, that, that whole thing with Matt Damon is all about this truth that if if and, and obviously the people who wrote it in their cellar probably don't believe in God but they were basically did anybody else like go through that and get kind of bummed out at that point because you're just like this is really what these people believe like if you don't have God you you start to realize that that movie is struggling with that premise and can't overcome that premise that self-preservation is all we have and you think about the things that Matt Damon did that were actually pretty um, ghastly, you know, and the way he betrayed his fellow space travelers simply in, in, for self-preservation. I'm sorry, they're right though. They are flatly right. If there is no God, if there is no heaven, they are flatly right. And to put it numerically, you can't get me to believe that 11 people knew this was a lie and went to brutal deaths because of it. it and, and here's the thing. One of the other arguments I read online but I didn't like delineate here but is a really good argument, it was, it was the motive argument. And they basically said, um, you can study this and people who lie, there's always a motive and it's usually power, lust, or greed. There's, there's a motive. And, and lying, it's, we know it's more than unethical, it's a sin. But it, it's always motivi motivated by some sort of selfish desire. And, and it's boiled down by people who study such things to power, lust, or greed. These people exhibited none of those things over the rest of their life. None of them were power hungry. None of them became wealthy. They actually all preached self-abnegation -abne and basically lived the life of paupers so that they could preach the gospel to people and they preached the highest ethical standard probably ever known to man on the level of purity and lust. There was no false motive for it. And, and you start looking at the motive argument is like, was really interesting, 
Um, I have to admit it was the first time I ever heard anybody kind of break down the motive argument, so I didn't like go into it in this because I don't feel like I can do it justice. But dude, that was that was heavy duty. But the persistence in perpetuating what people say is a lie is bizarre. I get, I get. Okay, if they had it, there was some reason. Okay, we're gonna get power. We're gonna get big buildings and big this and big that out of this, and we're gonna we're gonna become the cat's meow, everybody's gonna wanna be us and wanna, gonna want our opinion. Okay, I could see, okay, so that you could make the power argument, but that never happened. That never happened with the first century church. And, and not only did it never happen, but you could say, okay, I could see them all doing, okay, we're gonna get famous, we're gonna get powerful over this. But you know, as the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months and the months turn into years and that doesn't pan out, and they all 11 stick to it, and then they all go to violent, like violent deaths, like horrible deaths. Sorry, that's too much for that. That would require too much faith for me to believe that that these men made this up. It's just not logical. It flies in the face of everything we know and everything. Even the people on the on the contrary side of this would even say about human nature. It's completely contrary to it. Fifthly, there was there were the powerless enemies. All the Sanhedrin would have needed to do in the first weeks, months, or years was to produce a body. That's all they would have needed to do. And they couldn't. That's all they would have needed to do is say, is it ever, I don't know, it blows my mind when you read it, there was no investigation. There's no evidence of an investigation. There's no evidence of the, the Sanhedrin even pursuing trying to find a body it's like they knew deep down that there was no body to find and so like trying to find the body to produce it would was completely futile the roman empire you know not many decades after this was going to decimate jerusalem and then you know a handful of decades later persecution was going to sprout up all over the the roman empire really picking up steam in the third century towards the Christian faith, and all the powerful Roman Empire needed to do was produce a body. They didn't even need to, that's all they needed to do. So moving on, relating to the risen Christ in verses 13 through 31. Sorry, let me finish 10 through 12. So it was Mary, oh, I read that part, 11. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what, he had, what had happened. Then verses 13 through 31, the road to Emmaus. We're going to see um, three, three interesting dynamics when it comes to relating to the risen Christ. And let me ask you this question here. At the, well, let me read some. Let me read to verse seventeen, and then it'll set the stage for asking this question. So, verse thirteen. Now, behold, two of them, two disciples. Um, we know that one was Cleopas, and it's very likely that it was, this was actually these two disciples um, was actually Cleopas and his wife because he was married. We know that from another place in Scripture. Could have been him and his wife. Um, now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Notice the emphasis on, on sad there. I'm going to read on because there are three really striking things about this passage that I want to consider before we kind of just briefly talk about the, the, the big picture of this passage. Then the one whose name was Cleopas, Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and you have not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, This is an interesting conversation. <laughs> The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. 
when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Can I just tell you right now, it's, I think it's striking that he didn't reveal himself to them at this moment, that instead he chooses at this moment to expound to them in all of Moses and the prophets. For those of you who may not know, the Jews in this time period called what we have as the Old Testament the law. The first five books were called the law, and the rest of it was basically called the prophets. So they referred to their Bible, their Old Testament, as the law and the prophets. And beginning at Moses, which was the, the he's talking about the first five books of Moses, and all of the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone on. He I kind of think he's playing coy. Like, I like that. He's like, what things? What what things are you guys talking about? What happened? Like, he doesn't know, you know? And then here he is. He's like, uh, I'm going to keep walking, guys. And they're like, whoa, no, wait. <laughs> but, they, but they constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Their eyes were restrained until they constrained him. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Crazy stuff. Why does Jesus so often take his time to reveal himself to his followers? Because that's what's going on here. And in a larger perspective, he does it in everybody's life. Those of you who maybe have known me for a while and sat under my teaching for a while and you know some of the really crazy things God has done in my life and some of the miraculous things that he's done on my behalf and revealed himself to me, I know that at times as I've been a pastor, I've engendered in some of the people that um, uh, sit under my teaching a uh, a sort of a preoccupation with experiencing God, with having him speak or move in your life in a, in a really miraculous or powerful way. And, and that's fine, but it has to be tendered with the understanding that I walked with the Lord and I followed the Lord for roughly five to seven years before he did anything really ultra-miraculous, what I would consider... He's done, in my life, I feel like he's done five or six things that I would label as like, dude, you can't explain this any other way than that the risen Christ did this in my life, spoke this at this time period. It's absolutely miraculous. But not a single one of those things happened in my first five to seven years of my experience as a Christian. It just didn't. And, and then they didn't happen all the time. There were years between those types of events. And the reason I share that with you is because I see it in this passage. I see that he intentionally constrained their eyes so that they would not know it was him. And he does this with his children. He takes his time. He waits to reveal himself to us. Why? That's, I say that to get to this. Why does he do that? And I, I believe there are three reasons we see in the passage of why he waited to reveal himself to them. I want to make it clear, if you feel that way, maybe you feel like you just aren't seeing him in your situation. I want to make it super clear that he was in the situation. They just didn't see him. Not only was he in the situation, but the situation itself, they were seeing a version of the situation. You, like when you read the narrative, I'd encourage you to meditate. It's crazy. They're literally recounting to him that the women saw angels and the angels told him he rose from the dead, and they're, but they're sad and they're, they're not believing. And there is this, like, they're believing a version. It really reminds me in Joseph's life in the Old Testament when he's talking, I think he's talking to Pharaoh or maybe his children, and he says, all these things are working against me. And we know the big story of Joseph's life. And we go, sorry, not Joseph, Jacob, his dad. Jacob says, all of these things are working against me. And if you know the big picture, you know that they're actually all working for him. All of the things that he thinks, like his son that he thinks is dead, who's not dead, 
and now Benjamin's been kept and he's like, dude, all of this is working against me. And we just smirk and we go, no, it's not. You're silly. It's all working for you. But we have the vantage point of seeing the big picture. And very often we're smirking and laughing at Jacob when in our own lives, we're looking at the scenarios of our own lives and we're choosing to see them in a negative light. Even though there are indications that God is at work, we're choosing to see them negatively so that we can be bummed out, so that we can have the pity party. And even though there are indications that he's, his hand is actually upon these situations, these disciples are choosing to see the situations in a certain way. I'm done saying that. Why does he take his time revealing himself to his disciples? I believe there are three reasons. In verse 17, we see the first one. And it is because getting our emotions in line with the scriptures and with what God wants is not a consequence of experiencing God. Getting our emotions in line, and let's make this really clear, God says you should rule your emotions, not that your emotions should rule you. That's super clear in scripture. Um, he believes he wants you to rule your emotions and not be ruled by your emotions. And here we see these people who are sad, even though they've had a lot of good news and there are a lot of indicators that, that what Jesus said was going to happen is going gonna, is gonna to happen. They are unbelieving to some extent and they're sad and they're bummed out. And Jesus makes a point of it. I believe it's not unintentional that he makes a point of it. And they are, it appears... It appears like they are just kind of letting their emotions run away with them in that situation. Jesus wants you to get your emotions in line, but here's the interesting thing. Giving you an experience of him is not going to solve that problem. And let me read what um, Roy and Revel Hessian and say we would see Jesus. In the same way, the inordinate seeking for inner spiritual experiences may also thwart the finding of our true goal. For if we make our purpose in life a quest for these things, we tend to become occupied with our personal experiences or lack of them. This produces the sad situation of hungry, dissatisfied Christians seeking out one speaker or another, hoping that he will be found to have the secret, or going to this convention or that conference, mm -hmm. trying new formulas for blessing, seeking fresh experiences, and falling either into pride or despair according to whether they feel they have the blessing or not. This leaves the Christian still self-centered, occupied with himself and his experiences, and it can lead to much mental anguish through the confusion of our many teachings and the emphases on sanctification and kindred doctrine. You know what happens when... And so here's what I'm saying is, why hasn't Jesus revealed himself to them at this point in the passage? It's because he's trying to deal with their emotions, firstly. He's going to confront them. He's, gonna, he's going to call them out. I mean, he's going to be like, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. I believe the believe part is a reference back to the fact that they're sad, even though there are good indicators going on. And he wants them to get their emotions in line. And he wants you, Christian, to get your emotions in line. But if I tell you the truth, if it's simply a matter of him revealing himself to you, what tends to happen is that Christians then become focused on the experience. And it's not that the experience isn't valid. It's not that Jesus doesn't want you to experience him, doesn't want to manif manifest himself to you. He does. But if he does it too early in your Christian life, your emotional state then becomes dependent upon the fixation on experiencing God. And what happens, and I've seen it time again in my own life, when I, a lot, when I was a lot younger in the Lord, but also in the lives of people who seek to experience God and want to experience God and want to see him reveal, want to have a revelation of him in their life, is that if he does it too early in your life, you become an emotional wreck because you become fixated on the experience and how amazing the experience was. And that's why I've seen Christians where they're, Emotions are like a roller coaster because they're like, I feel like I heard from the Lord today and they, they're in a good mood that day. And then a couple weeks go by and they don't feel like they've heard from the Lord or they've had anything significant happen and they start getting bummed out. And God wants you to get your emotions in line first. I really believe that. Secondly, secondly, the second reason that he waits to reveal himself is because, it's because in verse 19 we see, he says there, 
And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, who was a prophet. He was a little more than a prophet. He was Messiah. Their perception of Jesus has been downgraded from Messiah to prophet. Please don't miss that. That's a big deal that they called him a prophet. Because experience should be viewed through the lens of truth and not the other way around. The second reason that he waits to reveal himself is because experience should be through, viewed through the lens of truth and not the other way around. You see, their perception of truth, whether he was Messiah or prophet, changed based on their experience. They had experienced something, his death, and because they didn't know how to process that, they changed what they believed about him based on their experience. And what God wants is for us to view all of our experiences through the lens of truth, that is the scriptures, and to judge our experiences by the scriptures and not the other way around. Does that make sense? And if you're following me, the next logical step in this argument that I'm making here is that if Jesus revealed himself to them at this point without correcting their issues, he would only be exacerbating their problems. And what I mean by that is if he gave them an experience of himself while they were still judging truth through experience, it would just continue to make them more experience-based. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. In my mind, it makes sense. This idea that many Christians, we choose what to believe about God and his, his estimation in our mind is dependent upon what he's doing in our life. And it should not be that way. So much so that notice this. This is crazy to me. As he goes down to verse 25 and he says, then he said to them, oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe and all that the prophets have spoken Ought not the Christ have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27, and this is where I'm like, how did he not reveal himself to him at this point? Instead, he bases, and, and catch this, guys, because this is super important. He wants to base their faith in truth, not experience. He starts in the Old Testament, starting at Moses and going through the prophets, expounds on the whole Old Testament, how it pointed to him. And we know, if you really actually think about this, you'll see it throughout Scripture once you're aware of it, that faith comes by, not by hearing, but by, I'm sorry, not by experience, but by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, right? What did Jesus say um, in that, that story of, the, of Abraham's bosom where the man was in Hades in torment, and he asked um, Abraham to send someone back from the dead to preach, to, to share with his brothers, and Abraham said what? He said, they're not going to believe because someone comes back from the dead. Experience is not going to change what they believe, is not going to create faith. What does he say? They have Moses. They have the, they have the law. And here's the biblical truth. The, the Bible says that faith comes through the, the scriptures. This is really important because this is really what's going on here. He is waiting to give the experience until they have believed, and they can only believe based on scripture based on script. This is a heavy concept and you need to get this down because this is, I'm not on a limb here. This is plain th biblical theology. Faith comes through the scriptures. It does not come through experience. Another way to put it colloquially or, or in layman's terms is to say that you do not see before you believe, you believe and then you see. And a lot of people in their own God complex, in their own heart, they want to see God, do something, do a miracle, do a trick, do something, and then I'll believe. The Herod complex, if you could call it that. They want to see, then they'll believe. But the truth is, is that seeing never causes genuine faith. Trusting in the scriptures causes genuine faith. That's what leads to genuine faith. And so he does something that to me is startling here. He does not reveal himself to them. Instead, he goes through the scriptures and explains how this, all of the scriptures point to him because experience should be viewed through the lens of truth and not the other way around. Truth should not be viewed through the lens of experience. Be careful of that, Christian. <coughs> I'm going to end on this final point. We'll, we'll do the rest of this next week. Thirdly, the third reason 
Why does he wait to reveal himself to his hurting followers? Is because he wants our faith to be based on truth, not experience, as I already said there. And, and I have a, a story. I want. So I knew a kid like 15 years ago who was in a car accident. And he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. And because he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, it was a T-bone situation where he saw the car coming and he was a passenger. And he was actually able to push himself up out of the seat and onto the center console when the car hit him. And his seat got like pretty demolished. And so he literally, based on his experience, would never wear a seatbelt after that. He's like, and he'd always tell that story. And I'm like, dude, you saw the car coming. You can't make this truth about reality based on one experience. That's kind of foolish. You're not always going to see the car coming. And it's not always going to be advantageous to not be wearing a seatbelt so that you can jump into the back seat or it'd be safer in the back seat. I'm going to jump in the back seat. It'd be safer on the dashboard. That's, it's absolutely foolish to, to make truth based on one experience. And so we have to be careful of that, right? So he waits. He waits until after he confronts them, after he deals with their lack of faith and um, gently apparently deals with their sorrow kind of indirectly. But then when they constrained him, when they put in that effort and in this final concept in that truth that I don't know if you guys, let me say it this way. Very often when we do dating counseling or premarital counseling, it's not really in premarital counseling. It's more like when some, a couple is dating, usually in the, the beginning phases of, of dating that, um, there's some sort of trouble in the relationship and they, they come and talk to us and it has been very, it's very common. It's a very common theme that one of the people in the relationship likes the other one more. Like there's like an inequality and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not meant to be together. Like when Alicia and I started dating, like I liked her way more than she liked me. I mean, I like, dude, it was like not even close. She was like, what? And I was like, yeah. And uh, I mean, I had been like, I had been like, yeah, for like two years. So I was like ready. I was older and I had like loved only her for like two years. And she was like, wait, what's your name? And it wasn't that bad, but it was like almost that bad. And um, there was an inequality in the um, desire. I was like, yes. And um, so that doesn't, like, when one person likes the other person more, or they're, that doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship isn't meant to be. And so we don't just go like, oh, well, it's obvious that he's just not or she's just not that into you. Sometimes it's that the person really wants to please the Lord and they don't want to open their heart to, and this was really the case with Alicia, um, was that they really don't want to open their heart to enough, to someone because they take it so seriously until they're pretty sure that that person is the one. And um, what happens is, though, a piece of counsel that I've found myself over the last 15 years give out probably a handful of times to, either, in some cases, it's the guy, sometimes it's the girl, is it okay, you guys have been together six months, nine months, a year, and you're coming to me and you feel like you're putting all of the energy into the relationship? As scary as this might be, I think you need to stop. And it's a scary place because there are a lot of people at that point that they're like, I'm willing to marry them even if they don't love me as much as I love them. And I'm not so sure that's super wise. Um, and so... I have to give them a scary, for them, a very scary piece of advice. And I say, you kind of need to back off the energy you're putting into the relationship and see if they start to reciprocate. Because sometimes they're not reciprocating because they just don't have to. Because you put all of the energy forward and it's kind of human nature to just be like, all right, this is great. You know, you always come over to my house and you always do this. You always put all the energy on. That's cool. I'm enjoying this, you know. And there's a part of that where that just happens. But there has to be... Um, at some point, in my opinion, if I was speaking to you as like my personal children, I would be like, dude, I want you to marry somebody that loves you at least as much as you love them. And so I would tell you that there's a point in the relationship where you actually have to stop in the dating relationship where you have to stop trying so hard and being the person that puts it all in. Because here's the thing. That's actually what God's kind of doing here. I don't know if you could imagine getting to the point where you've bought the ring, guys, in the guy's thing. You bought the ring, and you're wanting to propose to her, 
And maybe you've had a bit of a subtle feeling that you put more into the relationship than she does, but it seems pretty equal and you've bought the ring, you're madly in love, you can't wait to, um, to propose. She knows it's coming, but she doesn't know when, it's a surprise, and so you're like, hey, you know, I wanna take you out and do something special on Saturday, let's just go do a day trip, somewhere special, and and uh, let's, let's do it up. Like, just, Bring a bathing suit, bring some money for lunch, whatever. I don't know, however you want to do it. And then imagine her responding and saying, oh, you know, I got to wash my hair Saturday. You know, I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to do a couple loads of laundry. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is she's not as invested in the relationship as you are. Here's the deal. Jesus restrained their eyes until they constrained him. And he is very much so trying to draw out the affection from us, from true believers. The, the, he wants you to put some effort into the relationship. And we, being lazy 21st century human beings, living in the most prosperous nation that's ever existed, we tend to like it not having to put much energy into things. And sometimes we take that into our relationship with God. And can I tell you that for some of us in here, maybe you have walked with the Lord for 10, 15 years, and you haven't really, he's never manifested himself to you. Can I tell you that maybe you've never, like, constrained him, like, really sought him with all of your heart? Because the Bible tells us that if you seek him with all of your heart, you will find him. And there's not a human being that's ever lived and if anybody tells you otherwise, they're lying because they're flatly contradicting Scripture. There is not an, a human being that's ever lived that sought God with all of their heart that didn't find Him. Because God would be breaking His word at that point. And so when people are going to be like, ah, I've really sought the Lord, you know, and I just don't want to. And I'm like, so you've like fasted for like five days and like really, well, no, you know, I, I, you know, I, I read my Bible for 10 minutes the other day or whatever. And I'm just like, <laughs> do you guys understand? That's the equivalent of the person being like, I kind of got to wash my hair. I got I to gotta do a couple loads of laundry. At that point, I'd be like, I'm not so sure I want to propose to you. If our relationship isn't such a priority, I'm not so sure about that. Why does God do that? What's well, the simple problem? I don't, I don't want to reference that movie. But you guys can understand. It's been a theme in many movies. The, the, the billionaire, whether it be the girl or the guy, is a multiplied billionaire, has all kinds of money, but is looking for true love. And how do you find true love when you're that wealthy? Well, you hide the fact that you're that wealthy, right? And so you, you develop relationships with the people without letting them know that you're that wealthy so that you can, you can, you can see the, genuine, the genuineness of, of, of their relationship and whether they love you for your money or they actually love you. And that's God's problem because God is actually better than he, though his word says he is. He's actually better than anybody can ever even imagine. But he has that problem that he is the billionaire, that people, many, many, many people who do approach him saying they love him, they really just want his stuff. And they really just want what he can give. And the truth is, is that he then says, I'm going to kind of hide who I am from you for a time because I, I want to test your genuineness. And that hits, that strikes at the essential reason that there's a delay in him revealing himself to you is that he is testing your genuineness. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for our time tonight and these truths that we've considered. I pray that you would... Um, I don't feel like I did him justice, but I, I, I pray that, that you would tie up the loose ends in our understanding, Lord, because I think there are some really important, um, there are some really important concepts in this passage. I, I pray, Father, that for everyone in here that you would manifest yourself to them powerfully. And if there's anything in their life that needs to be worked out before that can happen, I pray that you would do that. I pray that every single person in, in here would know you and in, in, in all of your goodness and your nearness that you are our ever-present help in time of need, that you are the friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that you are there for them no matter what they're going through. I have found you to be there so many times when I needed you, and I had no place else to turn to you, that you are alive, very much alive today, and you do care. I'm so grateful that you resurrected from the dead and that we serve a living God. Love you and thank you for this evening in Jesus' name.